some of you may have already been to the previous panel. We're going to do some housekeeping beforehand. Right across the way, uh, NBC is filming. And so we have been asked to leave quietly. Um, because when we leave, they will actually be filming. And Mary um, is going to be interviewed at uh, 10.30. So 10, 10.45 in the back. 10.45? Mm. All right. Because we're going to cut this off to make sure she has time to get herself lovely for her <laughs> interview. Um, I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> so now that we've gotten those issues out of the way, um, I'm Nancy Glick, and I'm Director of Health and Nutrition Affairs for MSNL Worldwide, which is an international public relations firm. So, of course, that gives me no credibility for being able to be a moderator, since I am not an expert in global health, although, of course, like the rest of you, I have great interest in it. Um, in fact, everyone has a stake in understanding what is taking place around the world to improve the health of vulnerable populations, the challenges thwarting progress, and what can be done to address these obstacles. And these two incredible speakers today will provide a candid assessment of these matters. I'm a journalist by training, so I decided to see what I could learn about the state of global health in an afternoon on Google. Um, I went to the USAID website, and there were some very disturbing statistics, which I thought could just present, you know, a 30,000-foot reason for why this panel is here today. So let me relay some facts. Fact. In 2000, 11.1 million children under the age of five died, primarily due to preventable illness such as diarrhea and acute respiratory infection. Think about that. Fact. Over her lifetime, a woman in Africa has a 1 in 13 risk of dying during pregnancy and childbirth. More than half a million women die each year from causes related to pregnancy and childbirth. Now, needless to say, that's an issue that we haven't confronted here for over a century. Fact, at the end of 2001, 40 million adults and children were infected with HIV AIDS. By 2010, it is estimated that more than 44 million children in 34 developing countries will have lost one or both parents to HIV AIDS. And the majority of these deaths are going to be from AIDS. Here's another fact. The world's population is over 6.1 billion people and rapid population growth continues to put a strain on developing economics and natural resources. And the final fact, at least 13, 135 million children in developing countries struggle to survive without the support and protection of parents. These vulnerable children are the innocent victims of extreme social and economic distress, national disaster, disease, armed conflict, and exploitation. So if, like... Most of you, your favorite radio station is WII-FM, or what's in it for me, then the question is, is this relevant? And I would submit that yes. Uh, it is clear that the challenges that I just explained transcend borders and affect all of us. Not only is improved global health necessary for economic growth and regional security, but programs that control the spread of infectious disease reduce the threat of epidemics that directly affect us here. Moreover, new technologies developed to address global health challenges, such as non-usable syringes and oral dehydration therapy, often have direct application for us here in our U.S. health system. So... If we are agreed that improved global health is an American issue, as well as a global one, the question is, how are we doing in this arena? When it comes to increasing access to health care services, what has been successful and why? 
and where are global health initiatives from the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, or PEPFAR, to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation making strides or falling short? More importantly, what are some of the solutions to building effective functioning health systems? Well, today we have two incredible people who are going to answer these questions. Uh, Dr. Michael Clagg, Dean of the Bloomberg School of Public Health at the Hopkins, uh, Johns Hopkins University, and Mary Robinson, President of Realizing Rights, the Ethical Global Globalization Initiative. Now, I know there are bios about both of these speakers in your uh, agenda, but Again, I was having fun on Google, so I decided that I would whet your appetite, appetite <laughs> with some additional information about their accomplishments and expertise. Mary told me I didn't need to go on this much, but I'm the moderator. <laughs> so let's start with the distinguished Dr. Clyde. He is an internationally known expert on the prevention of cardiovascular and kidney disease and has been on the Hopkins faculty since 1987. After getting his medical degree from the University of Pennsylvania and completing his residency at the State University of New York Upstate Medical Center, he went into the public health service before coming to Hopkins as a general intern medicine fellow in 1984. See, I did read about you. Yeah, this is impressive. Uh, <laughs> during his tenure at Hopkins, Dr. Clagg was a find founding member and interim director of the university's Welsh Center for Prevention, Epidemiology, and Clinical Research. He was director of the Division of General Internal Medicine in the School of Medicine. And in 2000 to 2001, he was the interim physician in chief of the Department of Medicine. He was also the editor in chief of the Johns Hopkins Family Health Book. And he has been the author of more than 100 peer reviewed articles. So we think he's probably knows what he's going to talk about. <laughs> and now a little bit about Mary Robinson, who I have to tell you is so important to the field of global health and human rights that Wikipedia has, has their own section about her. Um, now, I decided that I would get her bio, for, you know, people can edit Wikipedia, so I decided to go to another uh, section to get her bio. So let me tell you what it says. Uh, Mary was born in Bal in Ha. Um, I had to get that from her <laughs> husband, how to say it. County, County Mayor, Mayo, Ireland. She earned a barrister at law degree from the King's Inn, Dublin, and a Master of Laws degree from Harvard University. After an impressive career as a professor of constitutional and criminal law at Trinity College, she did three things at the same time. She served in the Upper House of Parliament. She was on the Dublin City Council, and she was also on the International Commission of Jurists. And she said, oh, by the way, she almost got married and started having children, but hey, you know, that's what us women do. Then in December 1990, Mary was inaugurated as the seventh president of Ireland, where she articulated a special relationship between Ireland and the developing countries. She was also the first head of state to visit famine-stricken Somalia in 1992, and also was the first to go to Rwanda after, in the aftermath of the genocide there. In recognition of her efforts in Somalia, Mary Witt received the Special Care Humanitarian Award in 1993. Because of her humanitarian work as president, her background in human rights law, and her uncompromising pursuit of justice and equality. Sec uh, UN Secretary uh, General Kofi Annan appointed Mary United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights in 1997, a post she held until 2002. In this posi position, she was responsible for overseeing the human rights activities of the United Nations and took every opportunity to speak out on human rights abuses, such, such as the conflicts in East Timor, Kosovo, and Sierra Leone. In October 2002, 
Mary founded Realizing Rights to put human rights standards at the heart of global governance and policymaking and to ensure that the needs of the poorest and most vulnerable are addressed on the global stage. Among her key, the key priorities of this organization is focusing on addressing disparities in access to basic health care through policy actions in such areas as health workforce capacity, health financing, donor assistance for health, and women's health. So I decided, since there are two distinguished panelists, that I was going to pose a series of questions to them. And then I am delighted so many of you are here today, and you can also pose your questions. So I thought a very interesting way to start would be to ask these two, and I'll ask you, Mike, mm -hmm. and then Mary, to answer. So I've just read about your distinguished career, mm -hmm. and I'd like to start out by saying, so what got you, and then Mary, what got you to this point today in deciding to address global public health? Well, thank you. Thank you for that uh, really nice introduction. And for calling me distinguished. Uh, <laughs> I, I had a beard for 15 years, and when I, when I first grew it, it was black, and then it started to get grayer and grayer. And one night at dinner, I said to my wife, I think I'm going to shave my beard because it's getting so white. My daughter was about six at the time. She said, but Daddy, that makes you look extinguished. <laughs> so, so, so whenever anybody calls me distinguished, I think of that extinguished. Um, Please yeah. don't extinguish until after this panel, all right? right. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you know, uh, one of the challenges of public health is it's so broad because what we care about is health in a very holistic way and any exposure that affects health. So, But, um, you know, when I decided to apply for the deanship at Hopkins, I asked myself the same question. You know, how did I ever get interested in this? And <clears throat> in one way, it was an accident. I came to Hopkins to learn how to do clinical research and they said, well, you really need to learn how to design studies and biostatistics, go to the School of Public Health and get a degree in epidemiology. And I thought, epidemiology? Isn't that like sewage treatment? What is it? I, I didn't know. And, uh, and in that, in our school, we have students from 80 countries. Uh, we have people from all over the world, from the poorest countries and from the richest countries. And it was that exposure to other people trying to improve health. I was trying to improve health through doing research. But but I got exposed to the wide range of problems. Um, but as I thought about it, you know what really uh, did it was when I was a kid, I read um, the books by Tom Dooley, The Night They Burned the Mountain. And when I was in high school, the, uh, one of the instructors, uh, Tom Dooley gave uh, an address to Harvard Medical School graduation class, which was a recruitment spin. Tom Dooley, for those of you who may not know who he was, he was a... Uh, he was an American physician who was in French Indochina right before the uh, Vietnam War working with uh, local communities. And um, it was an electrifying speech. And I look back on it, I think it was hearing Tom Dooley uh, give that speech. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, Mary, <laughs> well, I'm sure there's not a short answer to this, but <laughs> <laughs> what got you to where you are today? Well, I'll try and make it relatively short because I begin by saying that uh, it's a genuine pleasure to be on this panel with Michael Clegg because uh, I was back in Johns Hopkins School um, uh, University recently um, and was taking part in the 10th anniversary yep. of a very distinguished centre on human rights and health. Yep. And uh, that's part of the reputation, I think, of Johns Hopkins. And also some of the work we do in Realising Rights is with the Mailman School of Public Health mm -hmm. And I learned a great deal from Alan Rosenfield, as I think many of us did before. Yeah, uh, sadly, he, he died. And I say that because uh, when I had finished my term as UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, I actually had quite a frustration because I realized that people don't have a shared vision of the agenda of human rights at the international level. Indeed, even in this room, when I mention human rights, probably people hear it differently. And uh, for many people, it's basically the agenda of Amnesty International as it was. Mm -hmm. uh, that agenda being uh, you know, politi no political prisoners, um, no torture, Guantanamo Bay type issues, um, holding governments to account, um, fair trial, uh, independent judges, etc. All of which are extremely important. But the more I saw uh, when I was going, even as president, as you mentioned, to uh, Somalia and to Rwanda and to other uh, uh, countries, and the more I 
went and saw situations of conflict and situations of poverty, I saw that deep poverty is a huge deprivation of all human rights. Mm -hmm. And I would meet women who would say to me, you know, I would ask them, what does human rights mean to you? And the answer would be a variation of um, access to water and freedom from violence. And that was actually spanning both strands of human rights. Mm -hmm. The important economic, social and cultural rights matter so much in situations of poverty. Access to water, sanitation, um, uh, food, shelter, education, and all of those are relevant to health. So again, I've learned a great deal from the schools of public health mm -hmm. and that approach. But what we decided to do in realizing rights was to recognize that maybe to a fault, these human rights were a bit abstract and uh, sort of set out a frame of what do they mean in practice. And I'm glad to say that our panel is about what does it mean in practice. Exactly. And so um, uh, what we've been trying to do is to show the added value that human rights can bring um, in uh, practice um, and uh, bring to development practice because when you uh, know that most governments in the world, most countries have committed to the Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, the Convention um, on um, Economic, Social and Cultural Rights and the Convention for the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Every country in the world except one and a half um, have... Um, um, uh, not have ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child. The half one is Somalia, which tried and had a government, it sort of more or less was preparing to ratify. And the other is, unfortunately, the United States. So it kind of leaves this country outside. Again, it hasn't ratified the Convention for the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. So it means in a conference such as this, it's harder to get a more balanced view of these broader uh, rights that are part of the social determinants of health and indeed health as a human right, about which there's a huge literature. And um, uh, it, it's, you know, it, it, it does add value in very practical ways because when you take a human rights approach, um, first of all, you necessarily frame your approach to look after those who are most vulnerable because it's a right of everyone. So um, minorities, those who live in rural areas, they also must have access to health care. And it's a holistic approach, as, as, as Michael has, has indicated. And um, also, when you take a, an approach of seeing health as a human right, it's very empowering of those who need access to health care because they can hold their local government, hold their government accountable. They, you know, they can get involved. So, um, uh, in a way, uh, if I could just comment on, uh, I, I've been very impressed by the quality of the sessions that I've, I've attended, the quality of the discussion, the, um, the erudition, the, the different perspectives. And yet I think what has been missing for me has been actually more of what you described, Michael, when you described um, the uh, Johns Hopkins, and I saw it myself in my visits there, um, more voices from the Global South, mm -hmm. uh, more actual participation by those who would be uh, you know, <laughs> you know, putting priority on these, these kinds of issues and that kind of, and we can learn a great deal from the way in which health systems in the poorest countries um, are trying to improve. We discussed at breakfast and I think you were surprised when I told you that Rwanda, um, one of the countries that was not only poor but had suffered the genocidal um, uh, killing in 1994 and has been um, addressing issues since then, it has the 90% um, uh, of the population have health insurance cover, mm -hmm. uh, which is a really striking example. It's, it's at a low rate, but the priority was to ensure, and I call that a human rights approach. And I was very pleased that President Obama, when he was asked that vital question during the presidential debates, was right a health, uh, was, uh, um, um, health a, um, uh, a privilege, um, a right, or a responsibility? And um, his answer was that it was a human right. And that has huge implications that um, I, I hope we have time to talk about. So you see why she's a hero. She is a hero <laughs> to everybody who cares about public health and human rights, about human rights. I mean, it's really inspiring. So, it's true. Okay, so yeah. now I have a three-part question, and I have a feeling that we can be answering this for a while. Um, Mike, I'm going to go with you first. So as I frame this, um, we're here today to sort of talk about what's working and what isn't, right? Okay. So my question is three parts. What is working mm -hmm. to improve health, health outcomes around the world? What isn't working? Mm -hmm. And what are some practical solutions that can be achieved to overcome these barriers, recognizing that we want to sort of leave this conference with a recognition that there are things 
that are doable mm -hmm. um, within the confines of, you know, our resources. Sure. Well, I think, um, you know, there's great need in the world, no doubt about it, but there's been great accomplishments. Mm -hmm. And if you look at, you know, um, if you look at the issue of child mortality, you know, uh, death from children under five, there has been, in most countries around the world, a substantial decrease in, in child mortality. Uh, and, and that's due to targeted programs that have, have improved the health of young children. On the other hand, if you look at maternal morbidity related to, you know, childbirth, mm -hmm. or you look at uh, neonatal, you know, 30-day uh, survival, that hasn't, hasn't uh, improved much. So there's lots of things that we can look at and take great pride. And, you know, the, the landscape is changing, right? So if you look at what people die from in the world today, uh, a million people still die from uh, mostly children from malaria, uh, you know, uh, not quite that much from HIV. But the burden of chronic disease, of you know, cardiovascular disease, of cancer, respiratory disease, has surpassed uh, infectious diseases. So non-communicable diseases now account for over half the deaths. And it's the poorest countries who experience these tropical diseases and forgotten diseases of malaria and, you know, uh, other, you know, uh, uh, infectious diseases who are also suffering the highest rates of, of cancer, cardiovascular disease, and respiratory disease. So those kind of, I can remember being in Mexico uh, or um, in Brazil a number of years ago, and, uh, and they presented as a clinical case a man who had come to the hospital, uh, and he was, uh, he was obese, he was middle-aged, diabetic, and uh, he was in shock. He had low blood pressure, he was cold and clammy, and they did an EKG and it showed a big anterior wall heart attack. And, uh, and they started to give him a little bit of fluids IV, and as they did that, he, he developed diarrhea, profuse watery diarrhea, and what he had was cholera, okay? And to me, that case typified what's happening now in low and middle income countries, where they have the, to the traditional burden that they've had of infectious diseases, but now the double whammy of uh, of chronic diseases. So this man was thought to have a heart attack, but in fact he had cholera. And so unlike here in the U.S., we've eradicated those infectious diseases fairly, uh, uh, pretty much, uh, and we deal with the chronic diseases. But in the developing world, in, in low and middle income countries, they're, st they're having to deal with both. So, so you know, what's, I, I can go on for a long time about, uh, about what's happened and, and what's, you know, uh, uh, other aspects of the changing landscape. One aspect is money. You know, if you look back in, um, in 1990 and, you know, how much money uh, was there in the world that went to, uh, to uh, uh, development targeted health? And the best estimate we have is about $5 billion. And in that time, it has skyrocketed. It's a, it's a log growth curve. So now there's about $22 billion that is targeted at global health activities. And that's both the U.S. federal government as a big donor uh, and, and uh, the foundations, especially the Gates Foundation. So, so we have more resources than we, we've ever had targeted at improving health in low and middle income countries. Uh, but, but some of those, um, you mentioned PEPFAR, so I'll deal with that as an example of what's right and what's wrong. So PEPFAR was the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. And, uh, and you know, George Bush, did more than any president in history to send resources to low and middle income countries with, a, with PEPFAR and the President's Malaria Initiative. It's incredible. And PEPFAR is a program where you spend a dollar on antiretrovirals, you save a life. It's really a profound, uh, profoundly effective program. I was in, in Uganda and I went to a clinic, which was a little shack, and walked in and, and um, my guide introduced me as being from Johns Hopkins and, and we have the contract to run PEPFAR. Uh, we had we work with people who have the contract, and people stood up and applauded. Now this was there's not many you know when you as an American when you travel to poor countries that doesn't happen very much. Happen so. at the dean or no, that <laughs> doesn't happen at the school. That's for sure. So 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 PEPFAR has been incredibly effective, but what it was was an emergency plan. It, it was akin to an airdrop where you fly over and you just parachute drugs in, and they created a infrastructure, they hired people to deliver these antiretroviral drugs, sort of a vertical approach. What happened? What were some of the unintended consequences? Well, one of the things that happened is that because people got paid more, it destroyed sort of the pay structure for health workers, and everybody who was doing maternal and child health and immunizations uh, moved into PEPFAR, right? and so they became employed by PEPFAR. 
uh, there was a, um, so, you know, our, I always say our motto is we work in 120 countries, and our motto is we want to put ourselves out of business. And you do that by creating infrastructure. You have training programs for, for community health workers, for professionals, and you leave something that when you leave, uh, you know, the projects go on. But these vertical approaches don't do that. They're very targeted. It's kind of a task force model where you go in. So they often hurt the local uh, health infrastructure. Uh, they, they disrupt the economy. And then um, they, uh, they may, in fact, hurt other health indicators. So, so they're very effective. And, and it made sense you know, when, you have, when you have an emergency. But now we have to think about how we, we take these programs and we integrate them with the existing health care structure. The, the, other, um, the, the other aspect of, of PEPFAR especially was there's a sense um, that we know how to do things and we're going to tell you how to do things. And, and so interventions in any country have to be within the cultural context of the country. And so PEPFAR is, I think, $15 billion, the first round of PEPFAR. And there was no evaluation of was this the best way to do it? Was this the best way to get drugs to the people? And then once people get drugs, what happens to the virus? Does, are we creating resistance? How do we make sure that we, people continue to take the drugs? Because if they don't and they take them intermittently, we get terrible problems with, with resistance. And, and dropout rates are high. So there was no, no sense of uh, we need to evaluate this program and see how it is, and we need to use that evaluation data to improve the program. I, I think, you know, um, um, you know, so I, I don't want to leave you with a bad impression of PEPFAR. I think it's an incredible program, but it's emblematic of these vertical approaches where especially people coming from the business model who when they see a problem, they create a task force and they solve it. You can't do that. Health is multifactorial. And, uh, and trying to, to improve health, if you think of, of uh, health as a, as a big dike you know, that, that holds the water back, by doing one thing at a time, it's putting your finger in the dike and then there's a hole over here. So, so Mary used some great examples. How can you have health if you don't have clean water? Right? But on the other hand, you need access to health care. And because the, as, as countries develop and, and people get older, the burden is shifting towards chronic diseases, we need flexible primary health care systems that can deal with multiple problems. And so I think we need to see it as a responsibility that when we go in and do these interventions, we improve the local health infrastructure. So I'll stop okay. there. Well, All right, I, so Mary, I'm gonna <laughs> a, I actually am going to ask you four questions because yeah. we talked at breakfast and something else came up, which I think Mary's uniquely qualified to answer. So the first is what's working to improve health outcomes, what isn't, um, what are some of the practical solutions, and here's the fourth. Is there a difference in how much is being invested <coughs> in men versus women? And if that is the case, what should we do about it? Mm. So take it away. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I think my task is a bit easier because I agree so much with uh, the approach that Michael has outlined um, about what's working, for example. He mentioned child mortality uh, decreasing. You gave a figure that you um, took from, I think, the year 2000 um, uh, of uh, over 13 million children dying every year. It's now below 10 million. And part of the reason for that is more coherence of approach. Um, I chair the Gavi Alliance Board, which is the other big fund from the Global Fund. And uh, the Gavi Alliance is the UN, the WHO, World Health Organization, UNICEF, World Bank, um, private pharmaceutical companies, Gates, um, uh, civil society, all working to reach as many children as possible with basic immunization and also bring on vaccines. So, there's a sort of coherence of approach. But to take on the issue that uh, Michael raised in relation to PEPFAR, in a sense, focusing on immunization of children and bringing on vaccines is, in a way, a vertical approach. And we were conscious of that a couple of years ago. And we took a step to uh, recognize that even if you immunize a, a, a young child, a, a baby, if the mother dies, that's not very helpful. Right. And we were aware of the woeful statistics for maternal mortality. Over 500,000, probably much more than that, women die every year unnecessarily, and many more um, have uh, you know, serious problems for the rest of their life because of um, problems in childbirth. And so the Gavi Alliance Board opened a window for strengthening health systems. Mm -hmm. 
and we decided that we would allocate initially $500 million and there would be a rigorous examination, but actually it would be up to countries themselves, developing countries who qualified under Gavi, to apply for this window of funding. The, the applications flooded in from countries. They really wanted to be able, and they got a rigorous um, analysis, and then we had to um, allocate some more money, and now we're in a, a bit of a crisis about um, what happens. And in fact, what has happened, I think, is a good thing. Uh, the Global Fund, Gavi, the World Bank, and the WHO are addressing this issue with an integrated approach to financing for health systems, but keeping that focus on um, uh, trying to have a health systems approach. But I remember very well um, in uh, January a year ago, it's about 18 months ago, I was chairing a panel evaluating this window on what countries were doing. And there were three representatives of countries from Mozambique, uh, Nepal, and Kyrgyzstan. So in fact, spanning quite different parts of the world. And they were being um, asked questions from a very knowledgeable floor of um, UN and other um, experts, World Bank, etc. And it was actually the Japanese aid agency that asked the question that really got them to sit up. And the question was, has it made a difference to you that you can apply for something that is related to strengthening the health system of your country? And all three of them got very uh, sort of active in their answer. They said, that's the difference in the mindset. We actually said to ourselves, how can we strengthen our health system? Mm -hmm. And I don't think we've done nearly enough to take that approach, the holistic approach. And it will be different um, for different countries you know, when, you, when, when you get down to the ground. The other what works that has been uh, important, of course, are the Millennium Development Goals, the fact that the world has shared these goals and um, three of them are directly health goals and others are related to equality and education, et cetera. But um, uh, um, having benchmarks of tackling um, uh, child mortality, maternal mortality, and um, AIDS, tuberculosis, and, and uh, malaria. Uh, this has been important as a kind of overall um, uh, approach. Um, uh, I agree with the, what isn't working. Um, we, we still haven't got an overall um, approach. We, we, we have now more commitment to aid effectiveness. I attended a big conference in Ghana, in Accra, um, in um, September last year, where there was a further commitment to more coherence. Mm -hmm. And the UN is supposed to be acting as a one UN but actually on the ground, it's not happening as much as it should be. Um, and so poor countries are still reporting on many projects to richer countries and spending so much time reporting, they haven't time to go out and you know, really work on the issues. So these are um, issues that we should be um, addressing more. But coming to women, um, I think it, you know, what has been really striking is the lack of priority given to women's health and indeed until very recently to the health um, of the adolescent girl. It has been quite shocking that maternal mortality um, is so high and that it is a statistic that wasn't improving. Right. The reason being that it needs that holistic approach. It needs access to emergency obstetric care. Mm -hmm. And now more African countries are using non-physician clinicians um, who are specially trained but not fully qualified doctors because they don't have the fully qualified doctors. They have emigrated and come to countries like this because the um, pay and conditions are so much better. And that's another issue we might come back to. But uh, you also need to address the barriers to women, uh, the barriers of early child marriage. In so many countries, girls are getting married at 12, 13, 14, maybe 11. Um, and um, so um, that's a very big problem. Um, lack of access to reproductive health, family planning, um, and then lack of access to uh, safe water, sanitation, and so on. So we, 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 we need to address those issues. There is actually going to be a very necessary report coming out shortly um, on the adolescent girl, and it's called a global health agenda for adolescent girls, and the shorter title is the girl effect, and it's the same uh, consortium, including the UN Foundation and the Center for Global Development and uh, the Nike Foundation, etc., who have been focusing on um, education for the adolescent girl, and you know the, um, the the reasons for doing this are absolutely extraordinary because studies have shown that when a girl receives seven or more years of education, she marries four years later and has 2.2 fewer children. Mm -hmm. And when we think of the population bulge and the importance of addressing that, so you know, um, there's, a, there's a real development approach to having more emphasis on the adolescent girl and the health of women. Now, how about the, this question came up, a number of ladies went out last night and had a great evening and um, asked them and started talking about our observations. And one question that was posed from 
uh, eight other ladies, was that they were just interested in this question of is there a difference in how much is being invested in women versus men globally? And um, if there is a disparity, and we're assuming there is one, um, why? And is there anything being done about that? Well, because we ra you raised this at breakfast, I was trying to find the actual figure. I don't know if Michael, do you know an actual figure? Yeah. But I, I think it was interesting that when the report was compiled at the um, uh, fifth year, um, uh, so the year uh, 2005, um, there were reports to the UN about progress on the Millennium Development Goals. It was a big Millennium project. And um, Lynn Friedman and others took part in the um, report on maternal and child mortality. And the report was entitled, Who's Got the Power? And that's what it's all about, who's got the power, whether it's at international level or local level. Women are not prioritized, haven't been prioritized. Now, happily, there is um, a, a real focus on prioritizing maternal mortality at last. Um, women leaders are doing it. Um, the Human Rights Council has passed a resolution last um, uh, spring um, that uh, maternal mortality and morbidity are human rights <coughs> issues. And my former office, the Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights, will have to compile a report mapping out, and that will, I'd say, include how much money is going mm -hmm. to addressing the components of addressing maternal mortality. But uh, it's certainly, you know, uh, um, if only we realized that development, whether it's education or health, of the adolescent girl and the woman is the fastest track to sustainable development for a country. Mm -hmm. I mean, most development experts kind of know this, mm -hmm. and then we would change the money and the resources. So, so perhaps I could give an example. There, there are countries in the world that when... Uh, a girl reaches menarche and starts to have menses, there's no facilities in the school hmm. uh, right. for sanitary napkins right. or for her. And so that means they leave school. Hmm. Uh, and, and it's this kind of hmm. uh, endemic treatment of women around the world that has disenfranchised half the population. Hmm. Uh, can, I sp can I talk about one other issue or do you want to? Of course. Okay. So, so Mary raised the issue about brain drain. And, uh, and, and, you know, uh, the U.S. healthcare system depends on, mm -hmm. on pumping doctors out of other countries to come here. And, um, and I, I think there are solutions. Some, one of the solutions you mentioned was that to, to train health workers who don't have international credentials. So you give somebody two years of mm -hmm. training, they're pretty highly skilled, they can be birth attendants, they may be able to do cesarean sections. But they, but they can't sit for the boards, they can't. So that's one way. The, the other way is, you know, we have a f Chris Byer who runs the Center for Public Health and Human Rights at our school, uh, runs a Fogarty training grant, which is to get international students. And we've had 1,400 students go through that grant, students from Africa, and 92% have gone back. And they've gone back because we make sure that we create opportunity for them there. You know, money is important. Certainly some people are economic refugees. But what most people want is to be able to have a career, do what they're trained to do, and have a decent life for their family. And so we, we form partnerships with local institutions mm -hmm. that ensure if we will take this student, uh, and, and these students often are middle-aged, mm -hmm. uh, if you have, if you guarantee a position for them, and then once they go back, we continue to work with them. Well, if, could I just follow up on that? Sure. Because uh, we're going to have to have a chat afterwards, actually, on this. <laughs> but uh, when I was taking part in the big idea um, session earlier, I took this as, my, as a big idea that I wanted this forum uh, to pay attention to. Uh, the migration of health workers and that there is a connectedness between health reform here in the United States and the migration of doctors and nurses from the poorer countries to the United States and that uh, it, it was extremely important that when President Obama was in Ghana he actually touched on this in a very insightful way and I think part of the reason was um, like Michael I've been, we've been working on this realizing rights and I co-chair um, with um, a very good health expert, Dr. Francis Omazwa um, of um, Uganda, um, a high-level council on health worker migration. And I'm glad to say that Tom Daschle is a, is a member of that uh, council. We have health ministers from um, developing countries, uh, mid um, low-income countries in Africa, um, South Asia, Latin America, and we have development ministers and health experts and academics. Um, and it's a very north-south balanced, and we've learned a lot from our um, southern uh, partners in that. But uh, the best example, just to cut to the chase, if you like, of a country that is adopting a more ethical approach is Norway. Norway decided that it had to address this issue because they had five cabinet ministers came together, the Minister of Health, Education, Labour, International Development, and Foreign Affairs. And I actually attended a breakfast 
with them um, a couple of, about two years ago. And they have decided that they really can't um, guarantee that all of their doctors and nurses working in the uh, Norwegian health service over the next 20 to 25 years will be trained in Norway. They don't have the facility. They're going to try to be more self-sufficient, but it's just not possible within that time scale. They draw from Poland, Latvia, Czech Republic, and they have decided that they will fund the equivalent of the amount of the education. They, they will fund, if you like, for those who work within the Norwegian uh, medical service and provide um, health services in Norway. And they will do it by a memorandum of understanding with the countries that they draw the, their health workers from. Now, uh, I'm told, I live at the moment of my work in the United States, in uh, New York, I'm told there are 600 Ghanaian doctors in um, New York alone. Mm. There are just over 1,000 in Ghana. Um, and uh, this advisory council actually sent a mem memo to President Obama before he went to Ghana. And he said, we must take note of the fact that richer countries do tend to draw from the health service. I think in this country, when um, there's a fast track visa for health workers from other countries, the view is we're giving them a great opportunity to work in this country and to further their career. And what people don't think about is that these doctors and nurses were trained, um, got their education and professional training um, in the poorest countries, and the taxpayers of those poor countries were paying for that. And they come as a complete development gain to this country. Yeah. So there must be an equity. Mm -hmm. And as you have your health reform, you will have probably greater needs for health workers. Mm -hmm. The need overall is 4.5 million um, health workers. And, and Africa, which has about 24% of the health burden, is only 3% of the health workforce. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, it's a, the global workforce. So it's a huge issue. And I'd love to um, actually talk more afterwards, Michael. We, we need to work more closely together. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm going to ask one more question because I have a feeling there are a lot of people here who would like to ask questions. And this came up at breakfast uh, today with Mary, and this is something I didn't know. And this has to do with global climate change. Um, you know, I think we think of global climate change in this bucket, in this country, and health care in this bucket. And what Mary was telling me is that at least uh, internationally they are connected. So, Mary, I'd like you to at least sort of present your... Hmm your short version of why that's the case. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to do that because I, I did want it to come up uh, again in this forum. Um, uh, because our work in Realizing Rights is focused on African countries, I can already see the dramatic negative impact of uh, climate change. Indeed, I attended a conference on climate change in Rwanda last September and it was organized by the government of Rwanda and the London School of Economics. The whole of the continent of Africa is responsible for about 2.8% of greenhouse gas emissions, the whole of the continent. And yet it is deeply affected by more flooding, more desertification. Um, the farmers in Rwanda don't know when to sow because the dry season um, has gone on too long. The, the, the rains are not coming. In parts of Kenya, in one part you have deep flooding that they never had before, mm -hmm. and another part desertification. And these are real climatic shocks and, and poor people can't insure against these shocks. Mm -hmm. And, it is make, and we, will, we know that because of the global warming, malaria is going to spread to parts that you know, it hasn't been in before. There are huge impacts. Mm -hmm. um, I serve on the Global Humanitarian Board, which Kofi Annan chairs, and the Global Humanitarian Board issued a report out of London um, at the end of May called, is it the hidden crisis or something, about the human impact of climate change, and one of the whole sections was on health. And the figures were really already alarming because it affects food security, it affects water, it affects um, uh, the vectors spreading disease, uh, you know, the uh, malaria where it, it wouldn't um, have been before. And, um, so, and, and, and the, this brings up um, a justice issue. Uh, who's responsible for the greenhouse gas emissions? This part of the world. Mm -hmm. So instead of helping the poorest countries to advance their um, Millennium Development Goals, we're actually, at the moment, um, contributing to retarding in parts. So we have to dramatically um, connect and, uh, you know, and see that connection, as you said at the beginning, are see, you see the need for it. Are you seeing that there is this connection, or is this a, a challenge? Um, I think there's a lot of attempt now to influence the discussions in Copenhagen, which have been tending to be scientific, and that's good, you know, based on the science. We know now, and I think almost nobody denies the impact of, of, of um, greenhouse gas um, uh, gases on, on, on global warming and, and its impact on 
um, uh, on uh, climate conditions. Well, um, what we haven't had is a sort of people-centered approach, uh, which focuses on um, the fact that um, what I call climate justice, in fact, the justice of the fact of who's caused the emissions, but also a different climate justice uh, dimension at the other end. The poorest in the poorest countries must have the right to come out of poverty. You know, in other words, to develop. Mm -hmm. But if they develop the way we developed and use carbon development, um, high carbon as we've been doing, and contribute as China is now the biggest emitter, though not per capita, the United States is still by far the biggest emitter per capita, but um, China, India are the majority world. If they were to, then we would not have a world that's safe to live in by 2050. I will have four grandchildren in their 40s. Many of us you know, have a sense that 2050 is a very um, important uh, time when we need a world that's still below two degrees Celsius and 350 parts per million. Now, um, uh, that means that we have a development reason to say there's no longer the same approach that we have at the moment to official development assistance, which we've been talking about, assistance to health, where when we have a rich world financial crisis, we tend to cut overseas development assistance because we're looking, that's them and us, you know, and we look after us. Right. But in the context of global justice, climate justice, um, we need the developing world to grow with low carbon growth, green growth. So we have actually a much more respectful connection that we have to have with them. We have to transfer the green technologies, um, live, you know, um, um, have societal approaches where local communities can have access to solar, to wind, to hydro, to water distillation, to all of the technologies that exist, but they're not available because it's not only their future, it's our future. It's the world's future. And I think that's, a, that's a, a, actually a very important connection that um, you know, I, I, is, is very relevant to global health. Would you like to say? Yeah, so I, I you know, really want to have a discussion, I know. And as a, but <clears throat> but your, your, uh, your statement about you know, uh, <clears throat> the climate change made me think of something. You know, um, if you look at deaths from natural disasters, right, it's an exponential growth curve. And it's an exponential growth curve because um, because of climate change in, in countries like Bangladesh where, where, you know, they have periodic flooding and half the country's flooded seasonally and that gets a little bit more and then people don't have room to live. Or, uh, but the second thing is population control. And mm -hmm. population control is something that has just fallen off the radar, in part, I think, because of the policies of the Bush administration, but in part because we focused on mortality from disease, which is substantial. But, but the population of Africa is growing mm -hmm. substantially. And, you know, 20, 30 years ago, this was seen as an important part of the, of the global health agenda, and we need to resurrect that. Okay, I am sure that there are some of you who would like to ask questions. So, would you like to start? A couple of brief comments. First, Mary, being a Norwegian-American, I like the word you share. On the other hand, I have to point out, Nor Norway is incredibly rich. <laughs> Second, now third largest oil exporting mm. country in the world. I think I'm of that heritage, actually. I'm of, I'm of Norman heritage myself. In terms of physicians, I don't know how many people in medicine have colleagues in South Africa. But it's, in fact, it's wonderful, but it's part of the problem. Because Zambian physicians go to South Africa, yeah. South African physicians come to the United States, Canada. And so it's, it's part of a complicated mm -hmm. issue. And yes, we want freedom of opportunity, but it's a one-way drain. Mm -hmm. I mean, it shows the the power of small amounts of aid, or not even aid, but small amounts of money placed in the right place and understanding the system. And you know, so when, when we talk about about health, as I was saying, it's holistic. It's hard to think of something that doesn't affect health, whether it's climate, whether it's pollutants, whether it's 
uh, you know, the dynamics in the household. Now, I also very much agree that um, microcredits, empowerment of women, local community right. um, uh, health um, schemes are absolutely vital, bottom-up health work. I mean, uh, not just uh, Mohammed Yunus and Grameen, but BRAC. In, yeah, in, BRAC is, uh, another BRAC is now example. working in Africa and working, and working on education of women in particular mm -hmm. and then on to health right. and healthcare. Um, and, um, uh, I mean, uh, the Norwegian model um, is not just a model that a, a, a rich country can uh, apply, to be honest. Um, I, I think it's um, a model that would be very relevant to looking at uh, the role of USAID in this country in your um, development assistance. Mm -hmm. Because if um, it were to be focused on uh, uh, contributing to the education and training in countries like Nigeria, mm -hmm. like um, uh, Ghana, like um, uh, Mali, uh, where uh, Malawi, sorry, where a lot of um, doctors come uh, come from, then um, uh, you'd have more education and training of doctors in those countries, and more would, would remain, mm -hmm. and you'd have a bigger pool. So uh, it's a question of you know linking with the uh, development assistance that that this country provides in order to recognise the development gain the United States has earned by having these fully qualified doctors and nurses come um, rather than be um, ed educated in this country. I mean, I do agree. I know that President Obama wants the pool of nurses in this country to be widened. And I understand that um, nursing schools in this country are turning um, applicants away mm -hmm. because they don't have places for them because it's very expensive. So you know, we have to realize that this country is actually getting a huge development gain. Right. And it's getting a gain on the back of the poorest countries right. who are deprived of the, the holistic health service that, that, that they ideally should have. So it's, it's a balance. There's a lady here who has her hand up. Um, thank you. Yes, I, I work with the head, World Health Organization in Geneva. Mm -hmm. My particular area of work is around tropical diseases, infectious diseases, mm -hmm. research and capacity building in developing countries. We work very closely with the mm -hmm. United States. My very much with the bottom-up approach, but the way global health assistance is done is top-down. It doesn't trickle down to the communities mm -hmm. where it could make a difference. Mm -hmm. How could we turn the assistance the other way around so that the people at the bottom of the pyramid are the ones right. who are getting I, I, I'll go first, and I, I think the, the way you do that is that you involve local communities in planning. And, um, and you know, it's, whether it's a remnant of the colonial era or whatever, we, we don't do that in the U.S. Like my faculty uh, in our school, you know, our community oriented, we work with the local community. But, but for example, the, well, I won't, I won't point fingers at schools that don't do that at, on our <laughs> campus. Next time. But, the, um, uh, but, but it, it makes it harder for the person who's running the program because suddenly you have people that you have to include them and get their opinion. But that's the way to be effective is to link, is to link the communities with, with designing the interventions and, and oversight of the interventions. I think an example that would come to my mind <coughs> is what um, has happened in Ethiopia. You know, recruiting 30,000 girls out of um, secondary school, uh, you know, finishing that, and with a, t a couple of two years training, and putting them into communities, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and starting that community-based care. Um, and I think we need to use e-medicine a lot more and IT to, to, to help to bridge those gaps, but do it in a bottom-up way. Right. Um, and I think, uh, as was mentioned, micro-credit mm -hmm. approaches would also help. But one of the problems, of course, is corruption, right? We all know corruption when exists. It comes like this, started with this thing, it's yeah. away. You know, a small percentage gets, gets down. And, uh, but there are examples of countries that have done great things, despite being poor, despite having this, by involving communities in the, in the governance and, and, you know, carrying out of the intervention. My second comment is on brain drain. Because now many of us are starting to worry that it's not just brain drain. <coughs> Mm, yes. There's a feeling now in Africa yeah. that if you want to find a highly qualified African, go to the New York tax driving mm. company. Right. Find mm. a brain surgeon. Yep. Right. Find yep. Yep. So it, it's mm. not like mm. the, the brain is coming mm. to <coughs> the north and being applied right. properly. Mm. It's actually wasted. 
Yeah. Yep. And I think that's that's more difficult mm. for me personally to understand. Yeah. I wish it was serving humanity mm -hmm. in another right. world. But I think for a, a, a neurosurgeon to be driving a taxi mm. in Toronto mm. or right. in New York mm. makes the injustice even unbearable. Mm. Yep. How can that be turned around so that so that this wastage of excellent brain mm -hmm. is contained. Well, I, I used to serve, uh, for 13 years I was on the committee that selected interns for the Department of Medicine at Hopkins. And by and large, except for England and, uh, and Ireland, the, the foreign applicants were the map of conflict, right? You could, you would, whenever there was civil war, we would get tons of applicants because there wasn't a home. Uh, they couldn't function in their home. Uh, so, so I think, you know, what I would say is we need to create infrastructure and opportunity that allows people to have a successful life, that, you know, that gives them, as I said before, it's, it's not that, uh, in many cases, it's people who have commitment to help but can't, don't have the opportunity to function in their home country. So creating, I think, you know, for the for PEPFAR, for example, which, you know, is I think going to be the second round, uh, 30 billion, uh, some of that money needs to go to creating, to training health workers in those countries and creating a health system where doctors can, can function. Mm -hmm. And so if for every part of these giant awards that we give, we have to ask ourselves, how are we improving the health infrastructure in those countries? How are we providing opportunities for local health workers? And use that as one of the outcome measures as well. In PEPFAR, you know, in the first round, uh, it was number of pills. People spent all their time counting pills. It was incredible. And we need to broaden our view. Um, I'd be interested, we're at a sort of a transformational moment with the new Obama administration. Mm -hmm what your views are on USAID and um, soon to have a new head of uh, USAID and how, what you would recommend to the new head in terms of restructuring the agency and what the mission should be. Well, maybe I'll take this first because Michael probably can take it at a more technical level, but um, I'm keeping my fingers and my toes crossed that it will be Paul Farmer for a start. <laughs> we all are. And that, will, <laughs> and that will change a huge amount because of his own personal knowledge, his work in Haiti, his work in Rwanda, in Lesotho, etc. And uh, I, I think he, you know, uh, we had a conversation before he agreed to take it on, and I think he knows what he's taking on. And I think, um, you know, he needs to be supported, actually, when he does take it on by people who have this kind of interest in real public health, global public health, mm -hmm. um, to help him to create the climate for the kind of approach that we're talking about, mm -hmm. that it will be a question of supporting health systems right. in, a, you know, in a holistic way and, uh, you know, yeah, and sustainable yeah, way. Yeah, in a sustainable way. So um, the number one thing, you know, if I could pray... You know, you know, what will happen is keep politics out of the decision making. Uh, and you know, if you look at the pattern of funding, um, you know, over the last 10 years for global health from USAID and others, there's a, there's a rough correlation with poorer countries getting more, higher health burden getting more. But within that correlation, there's a lot of, lot of things that are out of order. And, you know, in the one of the, I'll go back to PEPFAR. I think PEPFAR is a shining example of the generosity of the American people. It, it's unbelievable. But, but that ABC, you know, there were people, so this, this idea that, you know, that you had to emphasize abstinence as the, mm -hmm. as the most effective way of preventing spread of HIV. When, and, and, the, and the prostitution pledge, you know, where countries had to sign this before they could get money. Uh, those things took this shining example of generosity and just made people so angry and they hated it. They were willing to go away with it. So, so if he could do one thing, try to keep politics uh, out of the decision making. Could I, I just think, Phil John, I'm, I'm particularly interested because AID has not had a record of uh, being able to translate the idea into a reality. And what we've been talking about this, mor this morning is um, the holistic approach. Uh, um, and as we've all discussed, the multifaceted approach of global health. And, mm -hmm the training and um, so if, how does he hit the ground running and try to have that kind of integrated approach? Mm -hmm. uh, I agree with you on PEPFAR. No. Um, 
But if we take maternal mortality, which we know is the statistic that really isn't improving, and right. we're nowhere near the benchmarks of the Millennium Development Goals of a 75% reduction by 2015, uh, I would hope that USAID would support a holistic approach to addressing maternal mortality. And that would mean uh, having access to emergency obstetric care. So that means, since there aren't enough doctors, uh, the um, uh, addressing with um, non-physician clinicians, um, Realising Rights is involved with the Mailman School in Trinity Dublin in a project in three African countries that have quite an experience of this, Tanzania, Malawi and Mozambique. And we will show the evidence in October when the project kind of comes to this part of before the advocacy, if you like, and the, the, the mid-level providers, as they're sometimes called, or um, assistant medical officers, um, non-physician clinicians, have had training, sometimes six or seven years, different in the three countries, but um, a tradition of it. In the, and um, the, the interesting thing is that they carry out most of the C-sections, and then there are a few doctors carrying out maybe 5%, less than 10%, and there's no statistical difference between the results, which is very interesting. So... Um, if USAID take this on board, then there's a way of ensuring a massive increase. And, you know, uh, um, uh, schools like John Hop Johns Hopkins already have links, etc. The other side is um, Amnesty now have a demand dignity campaign to tackle maternal mortality. And it links with the Human Rights Council, the human rights approach, tackling early child marriage, reproductive health being vital. We have a ministerial leadership initiative in Realising Rights, which has... Um, uh, a focus on uh, reproductive health. Um, the Minister of Health of Rwanda was talking at the Gavi Health Board recently about um, the situation of health in, Ghana, in Rwanda, and I mentioned already the 90% um, uh, cover, but he said our biggest problem is to try and reduce the number of births. Um, it's 5.5 um, now, which is very high, as we know. He said it will take us 20 years, but the um, use of condoms has gone up from... Um, I think 10% to 27% of um, married couples. You know, so, so they, but that was the kind of time scale that he was talking, even though they were very focused on it. And if I could just finish by, um, when you were talking about the ABC, um, I still remember a moment at a conference on um, uh, HIV and AIDS in Botswana um, where um, there was a focus on women and um, AIDS and the young girl. In fact, um, in sub-Saharan Africa, the face of AIDS is the face of a young girl. Right. That's the tragedy. They're three, four, five, six times more likely to uh, um, be infected than, um, than boys of their age for various reasons um, um, of lack of power, basically. Mm -hmm. And uh, the speakers met for a dinner on the first evening and were complaining precisely about that dimension of PEPFAR and the, and the abstinence, be faithful, and then whether you mention or not, use condoms as the C. Mm -hmm. And this young Ethiopian student who was working with us uh, got slightly exasperated with this conversation. She said, you know, why are we all focused on the first three letters of the alphabet, A, B, C? And I kind of took her on. Uh, I was moderating the discussion. I said, all right. I said, what would you do with the next three letters, D, E, F? And she looked at me and she paused for a moment and she said, don't eliminate the future. Mm -hmm. And that was how she saw it. Mm -hmm. You know, don't, because there's so many girls who are in fact, and, and it's, you know, I think um, that's why we need somebody heading up USAID who has the personal knowledge, which Paul Farmer certainly has, and I very much agree, no politics, just address yeah. the issues. And the reproductive health, I mean, you pr probably know more about this than I do, comes out of USAID, and, you know, we, we, we had an experience um, where we had a long, term anyway, there was such political pressure, uh, yeah. and, and these were the people who were responsible for setting the policy and interventions for, for you know, population control. It was incredibly frustrating. I think because Mary is going to be interviewed momentarily, I'll take one more question, and actually I'll take two if you're fast, but I'll this <laughs> lady first. No, 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 this lady here in the front. <laughs> okay. But I, I also would like to tell you, because some of you were not here when we opened, Across the way, NBC is filming as we speak. So when we do leave, please be quiet. <laughs> now I'll take you and then the lady behind. I, I just wondered about what, whether there are prospects now or whether you know whether there's any look at trying to fund things like HPV vaccine mm -hmm. or norovirus vaccine, mm -hmm. you know, which, which now are, are being used increasingly here right. with fairly little gain just because we have access to 
to treatment for the condition yeah. and preventing mm -hmm. other huge pains. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, it's one of those kind of social justice issues yeah. that um, mm -hmm. is very frustrating. And yeah. I just wondered what the mm -hmm. prospects are for getting mm -hmm. those vaccines. Well, again, thank you for the question. This is very much on the agenda of, the, of Gavi. And uh, if there hadn't been the financial crisis, uh, we would be probably you know, giving a real leadership on the HPV, especially for girls in developing countries, because uh, they are more at risk and uh, they don't have uh, the PAPs and you know, the, the other um, approaches. So uh, there really is a justice issue there. Um, uh, I'm very hopeful that, um, uh, that we will bring on the rotavirus you know, um, uh, uh, because it's so important and it, you know, it's so necessary. But the financial crisis is, you know, hurting Is there any um, the planning. about coverage of uh, serotypes in uh, yes. HPV yeah. vaccines? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, I think there's a um, path have done great work in Uganda, mm -hmm. and I think there's a pilot project in Uganda, which Gavi is certainly supportive of, which will probably, you know, give us some indications. And, of course, it's not so easy to roll out, um, you know, a, a vaccine for... Mm -hmm. The, adolescent, the early adolescent girl in the, in, in the cultures. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But, but mm -hmm. because she could be getting younger. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry. Um, this has to do with what the panel said about using non physician labor and also what you commented on at the end of the There's, um, in Queens, New York, we have one of the most diverse language populations, and their public hospitals were not able to meet the federal standards for translation, mm -hmm. such that the son came in with his mother. They were accurate information to his mother. So the hospital was faced with how do we meet these standards when we don't have the money and we have this incredible population we have to translate for and translation services is really expensive. So they looked and they said, wow, the same people who come here are the ones who work here. And so it was in the New York Times. They, they took anybody in the hospital mm -hmm. who wanted to be trained in medical translation mm -hmm. and gave a program so someone mm -hmm. who's been cleaning the floors for 30 years mm -hmm. or you know cleaning toilets or Mm. Nurses' aides was able to pay for to be tested, and if they needed them, they could call off duty. And what was amazing was this is about the brain waste. These people were so touched; they had been basically in a dead end job mm. for a long time. They were not skilled labor, but they had that gift of language, mm. and all they needed was that little training, mm. and they were able to meet their needs with the gift and talents present right there. Mm. So I just wanted to get yeah. your saying what you were saying is absolutely right. Look at what's there. It's a great story, and I, I think it, it kind of goes back to what Alan Rosenfield um, was saying very loudly and clearly, that we need to look again at who provides what services mm -hmm. in planning um, you know, for health delivery that will be accessible by all and that will be um, cost-effective. Yeah. And uh, you know, that, 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 that will require some yeah. tough taking on some of yeah. the medical and nursing profession yeah. um, demands that it has to be a fully qualified doctor or a fully qualified nurse or fully qualified interpreter or whatever, you know, it's a, um, I, I think we need to, and we can learn a lot from what's happening in um, the non-physician clini uh, clinicians and the community health workers and uh, the role of women in communities um, in, in, in many countries. Well, I'm sure you will join me in thanking these two. This